All right, hello and welcome to the Anime Explorations podcast. We are at episode four uh, for January of two of twenty twenty three. I am Alex, and I am joined by uh, still David, and I am Tora. <laughs> And this month, we're doing something a little different. Oh, explanation for my, for the thoughts for doing this is, this month we're doing Thunderbolt Fantasy. And we're doing this for Chinese, for the Lunar New Year, which is normally called Chinese New Year in the United States, but China is not the only country that celebrates it. It's also celebrated, in, well, it's, well, it's not celebrated as prominently in Japan. It is celebrated in uh, China, Taiwan, Korea, Malaysia, and on a lot of these countries are ones where they are involved in varying degrees with the anime production process, whether studios doing in-between work on animation or we have uh, inter-country cross-production like the show we're covering today. Uh, so I figured that for as a sort of theme month for going forward for January is cover covering works that aren't directly made in Japan, but are, if, if not anime but our anime adjacent so this will include so like for thunderbolt fantasy this could do puppets they could do works of chinese animation like Liu over the wall or um grandmaster of demonic cultivation we could even go into live action here whether with the live action initial d or it being that it is a adaptation of manga we could cover old boy um so with that in mind, um, we'll talk a little bit about how this show came to be. It, uh, this is a co-production between Peely and uh, Nitro Plus, which is the sort of collective created among others by uh, Gen Urabuchi. Uh, mainly, uh, Nitro Plus is a bit like Type Moon, the that which is uh, Kinoko Nasu's uh, collective in the sense that they more or less start their start doing novels and visual novels, some of them smutty. Um, some of them have even gotten licensed for U.S. release. Um, as of the time this episode goes live, um, Dramatical Murder will have gone off sale on GOG, uh, which hasn't, um, which started out as a porn game. The got released later as a not porn game, but the U.S. release has. <laughs> Uh, has a patch if you want to put that back, or DLC if you want to put that stuff back in. I don't judge. Uh, and Urobuchi is probably best known in the U.S. for his stuff like uh, Madoka Magica and Fate Zero. And Thunderbolt Fantasy more or less happened because Peely liked Gen Urobuchi's stuff and wanted to work with him. And then they discovered that Gen Urobuchi liked Peely's stuff because they've been doing televised puppet wuxia shows for years and he wanted to work with them and that's how this came to be uh before we started there were two other peely shows which made it to the u.s before this uh, but were not japanese co-productions one was woolen warriors which aired on adult swim and the other was a season of a peely fantasy series that aired on netflix uh david and tor have you heard of those or had a chance to see any of those before this no we had not, um, but now I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're 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 going to look at them now. <laughs> oh, I think I think Peely, the the Netflix Peely Fantasy may, the license for that may have expired. I have not checked. Um, I don't remember seeing it anyway. What was it called? Okay. Uh, I believe it just called Peely Fantasy. Uh, P I L I Fantasy, which appropriately enough, Peely is uh, Taiwanese for Thunderbolt. So. Oh yeah. Uh, Quick disclaimer here. Um, so the na- there'll be a lot of names of the show or characters of the show which are not just Chinese, but in the specific dialect of Chinese that is used in Taiwan. Um, I have a minor speech impediment that impacts certain phonemes, so I am going to err on the side of using characters' arts and art names or courtesy names where possible. Um, I'll occasionally use their uh, regular name if it's something which I feel confident that I can pronounce correctly uh, but I do apologize in advance for any name character names I mispronounce over the course of this podcast 
Uh, likewise. Yeah, uh, obviously. No disrespect is meant. We are just doing our best. <laughs> We're just uncultured white people. <laughs> Um, also, quick apology, David and myself are recovering from a virus, and so our voices are a little raspier and deeper than normal, and you might hear some coughing. I'm so sorry about that. Okay. The other interesting note with this um, series is, so the version we watched on Crunchyroll is actually the Japanese broadcast version. The Taiwanese broadcast version was done in the standard style that PB Fantasy should, that puppet shows are where there's basically like one or two narrators doing all the voices of the characters so like like a puppeteer doing a puppet show that you'd be seeing um live and that sort of or that sort of thing with much more elaborate special effects of course because because this is a tv show okay that so that does explain you know why it's you know classic uh japanese voice actors doing like all these parts like, oh, going wa- watching the show, I'm like, wait a minute, I know that guy. I know that guy. I know that guy. I know her. Yep. Um, this also leads to a bit of discombobulation with the subtitles, though, because the subtitles use the Taiwanese names, whereas uh, the Japanese voice actors will use the Japanese localized version of those names. So, for example, the character of the enigmatic Gale. Um, his um, name is pr- is uh, written, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, Rin Sue Ya, but in Japanese it's pronounced Rin Setsu Ya, Setsu A, uh, which is a bit of a difference there. Um, yeah. So, that, so, so, so if you hear, uh, if you're watching this and hear a bit of a break between what the subtitles read and what the uh, Japanese voice actors are saying, that's kind of why. Um, yes, that did throw me off at first. Mm-hmm. Now, I for the episode viewing, I admit I did not put um, episode zero, which is a making of episode, on the the viewing list. Did you get a chance to watch that though? No, I didn't know there was an episode zero. Okay, yeah, it didn't come up when we pulled it up on uh, Country Road. Okay. That's all right. It, it might be listed as a different season. That's okay. But there is a episode zero. Um, it is worth taking the chance after the fact to, to watch it. It basically just kind of shows what goes into making the puppets. Um, some of this stuff does make it into the credit reel of the of the movie as well. Uh, yeah, movie. we loved watching that part, so if there's a making up, we're definitely watching it, because it was just a ton of fun. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so it goes more into that in terms of production stuff, also what goes into making the puppets as well. So, um, might as well get into a discussion of the show itself. Um, I remember I'd recommended this to you before we started doing the podcast, and you tried watching a bit of it beforehand. Um, so what was, what was your impressions finally getting a chance to watch it all the way, th- the first season all the way, and the movie all the way through now? Um, uh, watching it now, I absolutely loved it. Um, just, like, I had one or two minor quibbles, but that was purely with the puppetry. <laughs> Like, the fact that, uh, main character, Edgeless Blade, uh, uh, Bu Huan, um, just the fact that his left arm has about an extra arm length be- between where, you know, the shoulder and elbow should be, it's just, that, that was just a super minor quibble, but the story was amazing, uh, the puppetry was absolutely amazing, it was just like that one thing that gives that I sometimes you know it was that little bit of uh, something just irritating, but it did not detract at all from the story. It was fantastic. Uh, I cannot wait to watch to watch the rest of the show now. <laughs> I, I feel like um, you know based on the like five minutes of the show that I had initially watched. I was just kind of like, huh, that's different. Um, And I wouldn't necessarily have watched it on my own after that. So I'm glad that this podcast gave me an excuse to do so um, because I would have missed out. Like, I feel like initially your brain does have to do a little bit of, you know, extra suspension of disbelief, given the fact that 
it is a puppetry show. Um, but anyone who's used to watching a lot of animation is kind of familiar with that mental gymnastic that is required. And it only takes a little extra time watching this show to get involved in the story and the characters. I, uh, I appreciated how... How do I want to put this? In the style of a puppet show, all the characters have very clearly defined archetypes, but not in a way that made it seem tropey or that detracted from the story. I actually thought that was a very, a very strong selling point in the story's favor. Because even though we are coming at this um, from America as opposed to Taiwan or Japan, it's still very accessible. Um, because the characters have such strong archetypal um, tropes to their characters. The story is really strong. Um, and at first you think you know what it's going to be, and then there's some twists later on that are fantastic. Um, so yeah, in summary, I feel like I wouldn't have given this show a chance, and I'm really glad that I got to, because I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think what helped me get over that initial hurdle when I watched this the first time is when I was younger and back when I had satellite and tech TV was a thing, one of the th shows that they aired on regular circulation was Thunderbirds, um, which that's marionation, marionettes instead of glove puppets. But it has a certain similar degree of pulpy gravitas. It's obviously not as violent as this show can be. Um, but it... But it, it, I was able to kind of help with that hurdle there. That and combined with having watched uh, and loved very much um, some of the, Jim Henson's more mature uh, stuff, like The Dark Crystal, uh, like Labyrinth, and also having seen Jim Henson, uh, the Jim Henson Creature Shop's work on Farscape, where I was like, okay, I draw my, I have a mental connection to these. I'm, I can sever that that connection in terms of puppets doing more melodramatic and um, more mature narrative storytelling um, without having, without getting hung up on the absurdity of it, which, and also to a degree, I think it also helped that I've never watched Team America World Police, um, which I think might have caused a bit of a mental barrier for me, um, or form, helped form one, because I would be then drawing that connection with Team America in that regard. Yeah, we I, I haven't seen Team America. Me neither, but, you know, um, I think I know all I need to know about it. I think when Americans do puppetry, there's very much a self-aware, self-mockery kind of thing that goes on with it. Um, whereas in other countries that actually have a puppetry tradition, like Taiwan, um, they can for want of a better phrase, play it completely straight. Um, because that that is not only part of the tradition, but they kind of grew up with this form of storytelling, and so it doesn't occur to them to to be mocking about it, like, haha, we're using puppets. Whereas in America, I feel like that's kind of the unfortunate first reaction. Yeah, that's true. I think it's also um, part of the reason why I think Mature animation has stayed, like in terms of uh, again using, using mature not necessarily as adult content, but in terms of mature narrative themes or just more dramatic narrative themes, um, has stayed as much of a strong tradition in Japan, for example, is because that's there's been that long tradition, of long going part of that being part of um, television, basically since television broadcast started in Japan. Uh, whereas in the United States, we never really had necessarily um, that same link in terms of with um, animation and a good storytelling that will work for both adults that that, that that will just that will work on a adult level, not just in a sense of comedy, but in the sense of weighty narrative storytelling, um, with outside of some certain exceptions. Um, which leads to uh, led to a bit of an animation ghetto in the U.S. and the same thing for puppetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, when we grew up and we were getting into anime, we had, I think, the experience that every 90 kid who was into anime had, which is our parents looking at us like, 
isn't this a cartoon for kids? <laughs> and it's like, well, um, no, this is not for kids, actually. This is very much not for kids. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think the first really big, m- not marketed for kids, at least where I was, uh, was uh, Princess Mononoke, which, you know, got a big theatrical release. Well, it got a small theatrical release, but it was fairly well advertised for the th- for the thing. With a lot of big name actors attached in the roles. Um, and that was the first, like, this is serious, mature entertainment that is animated. Yeah. That's maybe not the best example, but yeah, for sure. I know people who went to see that with their kids and were surprised. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, 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 yeah. It's like, actually, this is kind of, this is weighty. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely had some friends who, you know, parents told them to, you know, bring their kid's sibling along to that, you know, animated movie. Assuming it would just be Disney. And it was not. But in terms of puppetry specifically, um, I feel like most Americans kind of historical context for puppetry is more in line with the Punch and Judy shows of England, like uh, comedic violence, kind of like a Mary Melodies style um, slapstick performance. And it, it is really great to be looking at other puppetry traditions from Taiwan, uh, from Indonesia, where they had, I don't want to say it was less of a slapstick comedy approach because that had been part of it, but they also did, you know, very serious traveling puppetry shows that were for a long time how a lot of the population was entertained. You would go to the temple, take in a puppetry show, and, um, just the little bit that I've read about the Taiwanese puppetry tradition in particular. Um, it's, you know, it's storied. And so I really appreciate not only that they are keeping this tradition alive within their culture, but that they are exploring new frontiers for it. The fact that it got so popular on television, I think is a great testament to their artistry and, you know, the relevance of any form of storytelling in human lives be it um, puppets or animation or novels or what have you. But it's interesting to come at it from a different cultural perspective because there's always going to be that initial disconnect until you realize, okay, that's where this tradition is from and these are the kind of stories it tells. And after that, you can just plug in and enjoy because storytelling is a universal human thing. (laughs) So we should probably talk a bit about the the plot and also the characters, um, and also how they're presented. Like one of the things I like about the Thunderbolt Fantasy series is each character has a um, basically a sort of poem that is given at various dramatic points for the series that describes their character and their worldview. Um, not necessarily like like right when they first show up, but at a dramatically appropriate moment where we get a reveal about the character or when they're doing something really cool. Uh, we get a reiteration of um, Edgeless Blade's poem in the movie when he is kind of reintroduced as himself, so to speak, um, as part of the plot. Um, yeah, the premise of this is... Um, this uh, is... Uh, Don Fei, who is a um, priestess or shrine maiden from a temple that's protecting a um, magical sword, a um, legendary magical sword, ends up on the run after a more or less supervillain, not quite super, not supervillains talked about, like um, swordsman with a big villain organization with him. Um, the Bones of Creation is his uh, art's name, um, who wants to collect all the magic swords, all of them, um, attacks the temple, wipes everyone out, including her brother, and she ends up running into Edgeless Blade, who <clears throat> is a traveling swordsman from a neighboring kingdom, which is apparently very hard to get to and from. Um, and because Edgeless Blade, Shang Han, 
doesn't really know what's going on in this place. He ends up being suckered into protecting her somewhat. Partially by his good own nature, but partially kind of being suckered by a phantom thief by the name of uh, the enigmatic arch name of the enigmatic Gale. W worth noting is that his identity as a thief is not revealed until like episode 10. Whereas up to that point, he's very much uh, presented in the, um, the sort of mystical wizardy, you know, the v very Gandalfy sense mm -hmm. is his, is the way he's presented until uh, it's revealed that he's a thief. Yeah, his uh, in fact, his nickname among fan circles is because uh, he's got he's got this pipe that he's smoking. Um, is vape wizard? <laughs> yeah, perfect. A plus plus fandom. <laughs> yep. Um, and so to because the um, bones of creation has one of the pieces of the grip of the blade and has the sword itself in his um, under his control. Um. They decided to put a team together to steal it back, including uh, Master Archer, Sharp-Eyed Impaler, um, Spearman, and, and um, Sharp-Eyed Impaler's sidekick, the uh, Spearman um, Frozen Wonder, um, or Wan Kun Lun. Um, I believe, I think that's how it's pronounced, or Wan Kun Yun. Um, and also to recruit this, they end up um, bringing on a sorceress who is also kind of demonic, um, Jing Hai, or Knight's Lament, and end up unintentionally getting uh, somebody who it, who um, the Enigmatic Gale had screwed over once in the past. He, he, Enigmatic Gale he screwed over, over both everyone. Yeah, he, he has screwed over everyone. In fact, end up screwing over Edgeless Blade over the course of this. Uh, but the um, assassin <laughs> Screaming Phoenix Killer. And at this point in the story, in my head, I was 100% convinced that all of these dubious quest mates were the Enigmatic Gale's ex-partners because... Yeah. The <laughs> ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends. Because of the way there was just like this weird sort of animosity between them, but also a familiarity. It's like... Did you date? <laughs> the dynamic was great. <laughs> Enigmatic Gale really gets around. <laughs> it, it felt that way watching it. Yeah. It's like, that's cool. I, it, I mean, it makes sense. Because again, um, like I, I mentioned Genorobuchi and um, like dramatical murder is a BL game, so like he he's used to writing that sort of stuff in the past, uh, so that, that that's a reasonable assumption to draw. Uh, it also helps that like um, puppetry wise, uh, as far as the, the design, um, Screaming Phoenix Killer is a very pretty man, um, and so is. Uh, Night's Lament. I should mention also the third part of this co-production is um, uh, Good Smile Company, uh, who does um, various degrees of like the Figma and uh, figures and the uh, Nendoroid. Um, so, th so they provided some uh, character design advice um, for uh, for doing the characters in this guy that would work that on Japanese television. Um, probably yeah. the... the... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, because worth noting is that the character design, the costuming, it's all just absolutely amazing. More than once I was commenting like, okay, the, these dolls are like three feet tall. It would not have taken too much additional effort to just do this all live action and have gorgeous, you know, absolutely gorgeous costumes. Because it is gorgeous costuming on these puppets. And carving. And, and carving. Oh, God. Yeah. Ugh. If they are carved. Um, they, I know traditionally these puppets are wooden heads and faces. They are, they are carved. They are carved. They, they, that, yeah. they have some of that in, the, in episode zero. They show them kind of preparing some of the puppets. Yeah. Um, I mean, beautiful. It, <laughs> gorgeous. Um, and like that's actually like where the, the biggest contribution from Good Spell Company came is actually the face designs. Um, so... Jumping ahead of ourselves a bit, in the 
um, in the movie that we cover, which is set after this. Uh, we have two characters in there which are actually some of the puppets from Pilly's other shows. Um, the ah. impost the imposter um, is uses one of the puppet designs from the regular shows and the character that the puppet that the imposter inserts in the story as the main antagonist of his story is also the villain of one of the seasons of, P- of uh, Pilly fantasy. Oh. I did I was wondering that because his design did look like it was obviously very similar but it did look different enough that it was a little this is someone who is outside the narrative, which worked really well in the story because it was someone who was inserting themselves into this other narrative. And I mean, it was fantastic. I thought that was a, like a deliberate design choice that they had made, but yeah, it kind of was just using this other guy. Um, and so we get this, so we get this team put together to, try to pull off what is effectively a heist, but things in multiple respects do not go according to plan. Um, well, presumably not according to plan, but apparently Enigmatic Gale knew all of it ahead of time. Had some of the plan. <laughs> yeah. It was like, yeah, we... Uh, I Separate expected. plan. I expected this. I have many plans. Yeah. And I guess the way I'm putting it is, they did not go into what Shang Bu Han thought the plan, the um, Edgeless Blade thought the plan was. They went- Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have a great moment where he turns on the rest of the party and he's like, what the hell, you guys? I'm doing all the work here. You just keep sending me into danger. I'm leaving. <laughs> that was pretty great. <laughs> he's like, why am I even here in the first place? And we're like, I don't know. You seem to have just been going with the flow. But yeah, you're getting the short end of the stick here, man. <laughs> And the other character's like, why is he even here? We don't know who this guy is. And you're like, you're like doing <laughs> all the heavy this? lifting. Who are and- you? <laughs> well, apparently he had a very important part of <clears throat> Enigmatic Gale's plan. Namely, the others didn't know him, so he wasn't so they couldn't but so there could be no double crossing until they figured out what his deal was. Oh, <laughs> uh, um Yeah, anybody like, like I, I, I really appreciate Enigmatic Gale as a character. As he's, he's chaotic good-ish. Um, he's, he, he's a character who is a jerk, um, but his like ultimate goal is, I'm going to dick over the villains because the, the villains are more fun to dick over than the heroes. See, I would have labeled him chaotic good after watching the first season, but then after watching the film... I have downgraded that to chaotic neutral because he was just a jerk. Because, yeah, <laughs> he's like, he targets the villains, but he is not a good person. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like, he doesn't do his actions to make things better. He does his actions to punish the wicked. For, for his kicks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a good-ish. He, he is chaotic neutral with good tendencies. Ish. Yes, I'm not saying he's not likable. It's oh, no, it's that's, hard not to like him. That's, that's part real, of the yeah. frustrating thing. It's like, uh, you are not a nice person, but you are a really compelling character. <laughs> like it's, it's, a, why, it's why I like the last shot of the movie. So the movie gets into two chunks. Um, we are in two stories. One story getting into what exactly the, the beef is between um, Screaming Phoenix Killer and the Enigmatic Gale, which he, Scream, Screaming Phoenix Killer has very good reasons to be very mad with the Enigmatic Gale. Um, yes. And then also following up on, okay, so what's going on with um, Edgeless Blade and so forth after the end of the story? And in this case, it was sort of this... Um, where it turns out that um, Eddie Mike Gale has basically been going around spreading the news about how awesome Angelus Blade is. Um, <laughs> and we, and Angelus Blade find out about this by basically somebody pretending to be Angelus Blade to try and get free drinks. <laughs> yeah, honestly, what it really reminded me of and what I was so happy, I was like, are, for anyone who's seen uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, this was very much uh, an Ember Island player's sort of uh story in that it was the story 
that we had just watched up to this point, but it was being told it by someone else who had <laughs> definitely changed the things for what they felt was a more dramatic tale. So it, it's sort of a, this is what people think of this story. Obviously, the play within a play is a time-honored oh, yeah. time honored tradition in fantasy. Um, but yeah, it was really well done. I especially liked how when the enigmatic Gale was just regaling the villagers with Tales of the Edgeless Blade, he had on like this hat and he was just getting comfy and just telling the crowd the story. <laughs> For reasons of his own, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, like... It's it's pretty clear, like actually, I think Angelus Blade says basically at the end. Not Angelus Blade, and again, Gail says at the end of the first season, like, oh, with you. So, with after Angelus Blade resolves the problem with this basically scroll of magic swords that he's been carrying around for it with him for the entire series and trying to keep under his hat, and he has to bust one out to deal with the with the problem. Um, and Gail basically goes, oh. Problem trouble's gonna is going to end up following you, isn't this? You're going like you're going to be fun. <laughs> Your story is not over. I'm sticking with you. <laughs> uh yeah. Um those leads to the interesting point is like while Enigmatic Gale says outright, like, hey, I like taking down villains because they're fun to take down. I and destroy I enjoy destroying their pride. Uh, and you see going through the series, uh, this is actually my third time watching it, like with Edges Blade's dialogue with um, Bones of Creation, that he's, it's not just him um, just trying to get him at ease so he can try and steal the stuff. It's trying to find the perfect way to just kind of crush him. Um, yes. What do you want and how can I deny that to you? He wants to twist the knife for sure. Yeah. It, it's not enough to stab you in the back. I got to stab you in the back in just the right way and twist it real good first. And just Preferably rub it Preferably as you're reaching for your ultimate goal, but just shy. <laughs> yep. Um, and like, I appreciate that, that, that it doesn't quite work out the way he wants at the way edges blade wants here is, like, as a person who also who watches professional wrestling, I am familiar with the heel temper tantrum, <coughs> where the heel has been denied, has been supported, and something like where they've almost achieved their goal, but something stops them and they just lose their just, just lose their crap. They um, whether they just get get really upset in the ring or they like trash the announce table or they beat up the ref, or they turn on their stable mates, or whatever. Um, and so I appreciate that when, bo when, um, when Bones of Creation is thwarted by the enigmatic Gale, that he basically throws a heel temper tantrum that ends up screwing over, um, almost screws over the world, but certainly screws over uh, enigmatic Gale. So there was, David made a brilliant comment at this point in the show when we were watching it. David goes, ah, he forgot that evil is petty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to win. I just have to make sure you lose. <laughs> it was perfect. <clears throat> I also want to say really quick, too, that... Um, I really appreciate the ending of the first season because it, it has like this big build up to a world ending threat that then actually gets resolved quite quickly. And I feel like when, when you see this kind of thing show up in Western media, it is always badly handled and unsatisfying. But in this show, because everything is dramatized appropriately, <laughs> it's great. You watch it, you're like, that was awesome. Like seriously. And that's so refreshing <laughs> because ev because while it was while this tremendous world you know world level threat was dealt with in a very quick manner it was not done so in a way that invalidated everything that came before this was not a if you had this power the whole time why didn't you use it it's because well it wouldn't really be applicable to what happened before yes and and it, it 
there were there were excellent setups and payoffs but i think the best thing about the characters and the storytelling is that partially because the characters have such strong character archetypes behind them drama automatically flows out of the narrative when everyone's wants and desires intersect as it should which is the fundamental of storytelling right um but they don't have to spend a lot of time explaining things they can just get to the great character moments get to the action the banter between characters is fantastic even when they're just like walking along a path to get somewhere they're talking and it's great um and uh, really i can't say enough good things about the storytelling because i feel like these basics of storytelling have been really lost in in my western media lately and it's just so nice to watch something where it's, the story is good. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, it's it's a serialized story told well, told fantastically well. <clears throat> uh, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's just, <clears throat> it's a great story told well. It, it helps also with the character choices that they've made that it gives reasonable mechanisms to have some of this expedition <laughs> that happen. Um, mm hmm Edgeless Blade is not is Charlie Brown from out of town. He ain't from around here. So and he's never been here before. So he has reasons to ask the questions that the audience doesn't have, doesn't know already, in terms of how this country works and, how, and who the factions are. Um for characters to put monkey wrenches to throw monkey wrenches in the works, not only do we have um the enigmatic Gale, who is a trickster figure, even if he's even before we know he's a thief, we know he's a trickster. Um and and then on top of that, we've also clearly established uh, Wan, Kun, Wan Kan Yun as being um, basically a naive golden retriever himbo. Um, yep. Young, and, overeager apprentice. <laughs> yep. And so we expect, and so it sets up that we expect him to do the thing that he thinks is right, not even if it's really stupid. Yes. Yeah. The kind of person will do, who will do the right thing, not the smart thing. Exactly. Pure of heart and dumb of ass. Yeah. <laughs> I love that phrase so much. <laughs> but And it was so great when you finally get to the point where the enigmatic Gale kind of reveals himself and you're like, oh, wait, is this a bad guy who's put together a team of other bad guys? Of course it is. I should have seen it all along. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but because Edgeless Blade is our viewpoint character, we're viewing everything through his eyes. And his first interaction with Enigmatic Gale is kind of this, you need to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So that's colored uh, Edgeless Blade's view of the character, but also the audience's view. So during the whole reveal, it was fantastically done. Like, I cannot say enough good things about this show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also like how the show does, um, uses other elements, such as like narrative, but like production design and um, sound effects for storytelling as well. Like, with the exception of the first episode, where they clearly hadn't figured this bit out yet. Um, so one of the things that Edgeless played is his sword is a wooden sword. It, we don't really know it's a wooden sword, but it, 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 it's strongly implied. Um, and one of the ways they clue the audience into this is the sound effect. Whenever he sheathes his wooden sword, it doesn't sound like a shing that you normally, like everyone else does when they draw their swords. It sounds, or sheathe them, it's a fuck like wood on wood. That all kind of hit me in retrospect, like when it does become obvious that his sword is wood, and I was like, oh! <laughs> because whenever a character gets a look at, you know, gets his sword, they unsheath it, and they're like, what? <laughs> that That's good foley right there. <laughs> this is just a piece of wood he's painted to look like metal. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, oh, but... 
the the fighting is great. Everybody has their own kind of style. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of flourish in that wuxia tradition, which I happen to really love. Um, but even with all the flourishing going on, you can tell that everybody fights kind of their own particular way, which I appreciate. Honestly, I kind of loved the fact that Edgeless Blade didn't really have a lot of flourishes. Right. He was like straight... They kind of set him apart a little bit because he just chops at things. Yeah. <laughs> it's like he... Yeah, like Frozen Wonder, Screaming Phoenix Killer, even Sharp-Eyed Impaler. They all have these very elaborate, very, you know, wuxia-style moves. And Edgeless Blade is just... Straightforward. He's a man with an axe who needs to hit, break a log. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it works well also with um like um like with, with how hit with how actually with the vi- how the violence works in the show um because like when you have because so to be clear for those who are thinking oh it's a puppet show i can probably watch this with my kids this is a spectacularly violent show this uh, is an amazingly bloody show like it's puppets but these puppets bleed <laughs> yeah it, it is it is clear that the blood isn't real, but. <laughs> but this is still someone just got stabbed <laughs> through their chest. Yeah. <laughs> and they're coughing up blood. Full like, on. <laughs> and like, actually, like, one of the places this particularly came up, where, like, even with me watching this, like, my third time, I was like, Ew! is there's this one antagonist yes. who, um, know what Edgeless, you're talking about. <laughs> who Edgeless Blade beats and stabs them in the chest and basically shoves their rib cage out their back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And, and, and so their dead bodies just kind of sitting there for the rest of the scene with the rib sticking out the back. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that is a design choice. And I salute you for sticking to it, but it might not have been necessary. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's, it, it's still a very like campy sort of violence. Like, it's of the Mortal Kombat school of somebody, ex- that guy exploded, and I think I saw five rib cages come out of them, but still. That is a great comparison, yes. Yeah. This Mortal Kombat style violence. <laughs> uh, more 90s Mortal Kombat, when it was still a little more cartoony. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's fair, I haven't kept up. Yeah, that that was, that was a well, yeah. really pleasant, like, really fun show to watch, and I, I'm Glad I got a chance. Glad we rewatched this together. Um, well, I'm looking forward to watching the rest of it now. Yeah. Also, we we didn't mention this yet, but the music slaps. Oh god. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. This is the first show we've covered so far that features the music. This is our first Sawano drop. Um, <laughs> and um, opening theme by TM Revolution. Boom. Oh! Speaking of which, so the end of the second movie features a bunch of characters from the kingdom that uh, Edgeless Blade came from who have found out where Edgeless Blade is now and is coming to uh, d- to either fight him or help him. Um, so one of the, if you watched episode zero, this is one of the foreshadowing bit, is the puppet with the um, talking musical instruments of pipa, which is a traditional um, instrument from Taiwan. Uh, he is deliberately modeled based on TM Revolution. <laughs> Love that. I mean, specifically, like they just like, before they did the movie, they just made the character for promotional reasons because, like, oh hey, we like this. Like, hey, we really appreciate the music that um, Takanori Nishizawa uh, Nishikawa was doing for the show, and so uh, we'll do this character based on him um, as a tribute. And now, like, oh, hey, we, we we're, need to add a new character for the show. Let's add, um, let's use this character. Made this one. Bring on the bard. And he's voiced by Takanori Nishikawa as well. Yay! Like, Which, you know, is a long history of doing that in anime, of getting the, uh, you know, bit part for the guy who's doing your soundtrack. Oh, well, he, I'm just going to say, like, he, he's a bit more of a height of, um... A little more of a significant character in season two. Without getting yeah. into spoilers. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. Other people's mileage may vary, but I love the trope of traditional instruments that suddenly become heavy metal ones in the middle of a fight scene. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
It's not even that far fetched. I follow this guy on TikTok who plays the shamisen, which is a traditional Japanese instrument. Oh, I love the shamisen. And it rocks, dude. He's doing the most amazing riffs on that thing. <laughs> so it happens. It happens. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, I don't know if y'all heard of Waga- of um, Wagaki Band. You know, it actually sounds familiar. Maybe. They're a Japanese band that, that, that combines traditional instruments, including the shamisen, with heavy metal and rock music. Um, like, they did a um, album with, uh, I think it's Amy Lee, formerly of Evanescence. Um, nice. They, and I, I want to say, like, they, I, they like, a, like, the full album, they did a live show, in, and, like, one of their staples was their version of um, Sinbon Zakura. Um, the Hatsune Miku song. And there is a live recording of Wakaki Band with Amy Lee on vocals doing Senbon Zakura. Nice. So if you so that's out there if you want if you want to look for it. Love it. It is it's it's so interesting coming at um well, I'm just gonna say the whole Japanese music scene I've always been very interested in, and I won't say anything else because I'm I haven't done any research on it and I'm pretty ignorant, but I just, there's some amazing stuff out there, guys. <laughs> I appreciate the fact that, um, I don't know if this is just specifically when Johnny Kitagawa died or started going before that, but we're getting more J-Rock and J-Pop on like the American and Western streaming services now. Like the openings for all, all of the seasons of Thunderbolt Fantasy are on Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, and I think Amazon Music now as well. So Nice. So you can just... So, yeah, so it's one of the things where like, oh, I like this show's music. Odds are pretty good, unless it's Johnny, unless the um, record label is, or their agency for the musician is Johnny's, because Johnny's got a Johnny's. Um, then you can get that through your street, through your local streaming service wherever you are and listen to it legitimately as opposed to back in the day where either you spent a massive chunk of money to import it or you found somebody who uploaded it on um on a news group somewhere um i don't know alt.binaries.music.jpop or whatever yeah um and download it that way i had a heartbreaking experience as a young woman where i Drove out to Gresham to go to the um, the Uwajimaya there because they had a little Kinokuniya adjunct. And I went and I was looking for one specific album of music. It was a Gundam album. There were too many Gundam albums and I purchased the wrong one. <laughs> because I couldn't read Japanese. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> I'm over it now. <laughs> See, that's why you should have just... Back when we were in San Francisco, go to Japantown, the album. This was years before I know, that. I know, I know. <laughs> oh. Before, um, oh gosh, before LimeWire and all of those, like. <laughs> oh, so it must have been Wing. I was like 13. <laughs> yeah, that would have been Wing. You, like, <laughs> you see kids today, he says, turning his chair around and sitting on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Backwards. Back you, in the day. I'm so old, you guys. You young whippersnappers and your ability to get things online easily. <laughs> I remember before there was an internet. Back in the day, you had to find a cat. You had to go to a convention and find some guy who had imported a bunch of music from Japan and hope to God they had the album that you were looking for. <laughs> With that, with the home printer label on it. Oh god! Yeah. <laughs> oh man, bootlegs from conventions. <laughs> that takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> oh. The culture. The culture. <laughs> I mean, like, like whereas now we live in a world where you can legally listen to the Macross Seven music on Apple Music and Spotify. I know, I'm so excited about that. So good. That's like Uh, some of the best music. Okay, I digress. uh, Yeah, uh, our our seven-year-old really likes uh, Firebomber, too. (laughs) We're doing something right as as parents. (laughs) Now, speak of next month, we will have some lighter family fare. Um, We'll be covering today's menu for the Emmy effect. 
This one is a 12 episode series. I'm make sure, and I did count it right this time because they put out one episode a month when this aired originally. Um, and I and I recommend when watching this, either watch after you've eaten or close enough to before eating to whet your appetite. <laughs> Because I it's, love food. <laughs> it is all about cooking. Um, this does not have a physical release as yet, but the manga has started getting a um, release through Dempa Books. And each volume of the manga has recipes for everything that's in the manga. In that volume. Nice. So, as opposed to Food Wars, where, uh, no, they don't have recipes in there. You have to guess. All right. This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. I love cooking shows. Yes, usually cooking shows make me start cooking. Yeah. Just just like, (laughs) oh, I need to go make something. Whenever I want baked goods, I just put on an episode of Bake Off, and David's like, you know, I feel like baking today. And I'm like, I know. (laughs) (laughs) That's so evil. (laughs) That is so evil. It works. Yes, it does. Does this mean you're going to make me ramen? I'd be down with that. <laughs> yeah, I can make rum. <laughs> Do you mean from hand? Because that'll take a lot longer. No, you could buy the noodles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Buy the and... noodles. Buy the pork belly. <laughs> and for um, our, for our listeners, um, if you would, if you have any comments about the show, please feel free to send your emails to Anime Explorations Pod. Um, pod. Yeah, I can't talk. Anime Explorations Pod. <laughs> at gmail.com uh, and we may read them on the air um, also of course make sure to rate and review on Apple Music or Stitcher or wherever uh, podcasts are acquired uh, it helps us become a bit more visible and helps get more people on the um, to hear listen to the show right. gracias indeed So until next time, thank you all very much for listening. Happy Year of the Rabbit, everybody.